thanks very much for coming on. Um, so for anyone watching and listening, me and you have known each other for years and years and years. Yeah. Um, we're friends, but we also work together, so you're the Chief Technology Officer at Data Vita. Yeah. And ever since I've been doing these podcasts, I've been wanting to get you on because I think you've got an important story to be told. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one of the things that always gets me about what you're about, about to talk about um, is most of us don't realise how much life can change in a 24-hour period and how much we all take our health for granted. Um, yeah. We, until that's taken away from you, we all just assume it's 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 going to be that way. Um, so let's go back two years almost to the day, isn't it? Yeah, two two years yesterday. Two years yesterday. Two years yesterday. So, very, so still very val. Um, very um, in, in my memory. Very very I vivid. Know. Very vivid in my I memory. No, no wonder. No wonder. <laughs> um, so let's go back to that fateful weekend. You finished work on a Friday. Yep. You came to work Friday. Life's good. Everyone's fine. Um, working on it, working on a big customer project. Everything was good. Friday, everything was going well on the project. Great, happy, home. Looking forward to a, a nice weekend with the family. It was um, Mother's Day on the Sunday. Um, so I had a, a regular Saturday. I was actually out on the Saturday for, for dinner with friends um, and my wife, Christine. Um, and all fine. Uh, got up early on the Sunday morning, take my daughter to tennis. Um, had a normal day on the Sunday, no no prior symptoms, no warnings, no nothing. Um, had uh, dinner um, at my in-laws that night, went home, got to about half ten in the evening, decided to go to bed early because I got up early for working Monday. Um, went to bed at half ten, absolutely fine as, as normal. Um, woke up at 1.30am in the morning with the worst pain I've ever felt in my life in my stomach. Um, to the point where I was literally doubled over and passing out with, with, with how, how painful it was. That's incredible. I, I always thought that, for some reason, I'd never asked you that question about getting lean up to it. I always thought you maybe felt crap during the day and, and a, a twinge, like you, you'd pulled something. That, that That's the thing for me, and that, that was that was the biggest thing for me, Danny, was that it was totally, at no prior warnings or anything. It felt right as rain the whole day and in the lead up to it, nothing. No, even, I never even had problems with my stomach in the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had this twinge, you were double over in pain I take it straight to the hospital Well, my wife Christine is a nurse As you know, mm -hmm. um, so she phoned NHS 24 um, And their recommendation was Go to a &E. um, So we live in Hamilton So uh, Hare Myers was the, the Closest to a &E for us So Christine took me in the car Rushed me up to a &E, mm -hmm. um, Got to a &E, and as you know, a &E can be busy uh -huh. um, into the triage area. By the time we got to a &E, I was literally slumped over the counter and I think the staff realised very quickly my bum didn't even hit the seat in the waiting area and they took me straight through. Um, obviously a relatively young man, um, no prior medical history, so it was straight into things like chest x-rays and all sorts of tests and getting lines into me so that they could give me um, pain relief and stuff like that. So, um, And it kind of really went for there and what, at first what did they think it was they didn't know they didn't, didn't know. They, 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 they had no idea what it was whatsoever so that was what led to all these um chest x-rays and i eventually got ct scans um i've had quite a lot of ct scans yeah. i must uh -huh. be my body must be irradiated how <laughs> many ct scans i've had um and what's the other one the big the big tube the, the MRI. The MRI, sorry. Uh -huh. can you, can you think that Big tube's fine. Big tube. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually very scary, that MRI. For I, MD, I so that. It, you are literally, your nose is touching the, 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 the kind of top of the tunnel. Um, and when you're you're in that tunnel, they, they put music on for you and stuff to try and relax yeah. you. But I was, it was 15 minutes I had to be in it for. Um, and they give you a, a kind of an alarm that you can press. And it got to about, must have been about, 12 minutes in and I was so close to pressing the button to get out of there it was it was horribly claustrophobic yeah um it was it was horrible but anyway the, the whole the whole thing all these tests eventually and all these um scans etc it led to them telling me I had acute pancreatitis um which you know I knew that the human body had a pancreas but I didn't actually know it was probably a lot of people who don't really didn't really know very much about what its function was what it does and it actually turns out it's quite, it's quite, it's, quite it's quite key to your whole body, and it can um, try and kill you. Yeah, and uh -huh. it can definitely try and kill you. So at that point, the, the, you didn't really 
understand the severity of what you were about to go into because I can remember you texting me on the Monday morning saying I was in hospital at the weekend, sitting here waiting for more tests but we were texting back and forward yeah. and it all seemed relatively okay at that point and I guess at that point you're thinking I'm going to be in here for a couple of days and then bouncing straight back out. Yeah, I, I guess like anything, I mean, you just, when you think you're fit and healthy and you've not got any prior medical history, you just think, well, it's maybe just a, it's just a sore stomach. Mm -hmm. and obviously it's quite a, <laughs> quite a sore, sore stomach, but um, yeah, I just assumed it would be a case of they would get me back on my feet and I'd, I'd be out when a, when a week or so. And that led to, I guess you were in here miles for a few weeks, I, weren't you? I think it was be some somewhere between four and six weeks I was in here miles. Uh, and during that time, it was just getting worse and worse and yeah. worse and worse. Yeah, my condition deteriorated um, mm -hmm. quite a bit in there. Um, they hadn't really, from a treatment point of view, the for for pancreatitis as a kind of watch and wait policy. There mm -hmm. seems to be a watch and wait because what happens is your body starts releasing um, so collections of fluid and stuff inside your body in places you shouldn't have collections mm -hmm. of fluid. You know um, I love all this stuff when you I start know talking you about it. I know you do. That's what I was looking forward to. So let's get into some right graphic detail. <laughs> um, yeah, ironically as well, I'm, oh, I don't know if I'm anymore, but I was a very, very squeamish person. So the whole hospital thing for me, that just freaked me out. Mm -hmm. um, don't like hospitals, don't like needles, doctors, all that stuff. Um, but in, in here, Myers, for, for you, between four and six weeks, things went from bad to worse. And um, it was at that point that there was a decision made to transfer me to the, the, the Glasgow Royal. Yeah, it was uh, just, I can remember just every day the update was getting a little bit more and more ominous. I mean, then at one point, I'm no longer getting updates from you, I'm getting updates from your wife. Yeah. And that's when you start to think, oh, shit. Something's not right here. Yeah. No, mm. no, I, and I think, um, as I say, I spent uh, spent some time in high dependency in, in Hare Myers mm -hmm. as well. And it's all a bit, some it's a bit hazy for me. Mm -hmm. and I talked to Christine about it. Christine kind of fills in loads of blanks. Um, Clothes, a, a load of stuff that I've mm -hmm. probably just purposely blanked out of my, blanked out of my memory <laughs> deliberately. Right. Yeah. Really, so, so move to, move to the Royal. Yeah. Um, I guess, luckily, there's a consultant at the Royal who kind of specialises in, in what you have, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. so that was the whole reason for getting getting moved to the Royal, because a, a consultant there um, who's been looking after me, who is one of the specialists in this field and, and one of the top people in the UK, if not um, if not in the world. Um, so I've been very, very fortunate that his care, um, I don't think if it wasn't for it being him, and we'll probably come on to speak a bit more about that, yeah. but... If it, I'm quite adamant, and, and Christine said this as well, if it hadn't been him that night operating on me, I probably wouldn't be here today, uh -huh. um, given given the way things transpired. Yeah. So it was interesting getting moved to Royal because they blue light ambulanced me. Oh, did they? Yeah. I didn't know that either. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was funny because um, there was a it was a guy driving and there was a girl um, in, in the back of the ambulance, you know, with me, and we're chatting away, as you do, but the, the guy's driving was honestly unbelievable. He was absolutely flying. Um, I didn't think it was a kind of blue light situation, but they blue lighted me. I guess it's those wee things that might make the reality kind of hit home a wee bit. Now, when you're thinking, hang on a minute, they're actually blue lighting me between hospitals. Yeah, aye. Oh, that definitely, that was mm -hmm. um, definitely for me. I was like, and hold on, I didn't think things were... At, at, at this stage, were you still thinking, were you aware of the severity at that stage? I don't think I was. Uh -huh. Um, I think I'm not well, but yeah, I, I realised I realised it was different for just a normal. You know, I'm not feeling. I'm not feeling great. I need a uh -huh. quick. You know, but I didn't. I didn't understand the, the magnitude of what it was. Uh -huh. Um, and I guess when I when I did go to the royal, that was obviously my my first interaction with that consultant. Mm -hmm. Um, and he did explain things to me. He says things with pancreatitis can be very very slow, and you'll get bored and frustrated. He says, but that's a good thing. He says, if you're bored and frustrated, things are not going badly. And with hindsight... What you wish you'd what, been bored. Well, well, what he was telling me, because sometimes, you, well, you, you know me quite well, mm -hmm. so you know I'm, I get a bit antsy if I've not got something to do. Um, I think in terms of I was bored and starting to get frustrated, mm -hmm. and he was very much be careful what you wish for, and, 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 and sure enough, you know, when things went wrong, they, they really went wrong. So... Um, um, to that point then, so um, I think I'd come in to see you um, a couple of days before um, and then I, I text you and we were in a, in a, a text chat um, and your last text message to me, because I remember looking at it for ages and weeks and weeks after this, was saying, um, 
I feel is best if I ever have. Um, I feel really good and strong today. I feel like I'm on the turn. And that was a last text message yeah. I got from you for six months. <laughs> um, so after you sent that text message, what did you do? <laughs> yeah. Um, so in, in terms of what happened at that, that point, and, and again, it is something that's quite hazy, but I'll, I'll kind of try and, <laughs> try, and, try and remember as much as I can. So I was improving. So there was, there was, there was that improvement. They did a procedure on me to drain these collections that had, that had happened. Um, that went wrong, believe it or not. So that was a, a an endoscope. So the camera down is endoscopically mm -hmm. draining these collections, however they, however they managed to do that. Um, so I went through that procedure and I remember waking up, still on the table where they'd done the endoscope and there was like kind of this, all I can describe it as brown toxic waste everywhere, all over me. Um, and they'd kind of said when they did that endoscope, there was like, way more fluid than they were expecting it went wrong and when it came out ended up going everywhere I went back but when I went back to the ward that night after that procedure I actually did feel and that was that was probably when I texted you mm -hmm. um, I actually did feel well I actually did felt because I had been feeling pretty miserable at that point and I think just obviously the release of that fluid mm -hmm. out my body um, but then that was when things very very quickly took a turn that was when I started vomiting and it was and, and again it was the only way I can describe it was like vomiting toxic waste um, it was horrendous and I, I knew myself at that point I thought oh this this can't be good I don't know I don't know what's going on here um, and that then knew that kind of progressed and that kept going that kept going for, for, a, for a number of days um, and obviously family coming to visit me and things like that and I was just I was just miserable um, and then obviously I hadn't been eating or drinking or anything like that either. And I think it got to the point where I think um, Christine or somebody must have brought me an ice law to have. And I took some of the ice law and it was great. It was just so refreshing to have a bit of an ice law. But then quite soon after that, I started vomiting and it was blood that I was vomiting, um, which was pretty scary. Can you um, remember all this? I can remember this bit. And after this bit, this is when it starts to get hazy. So I started vomiting blood and... They kind of t they sent me for a scan. I went for an RCT scan. Did the nurse not come running in to help and slipped or something like that? I think that's later. I think that's later right. On. Okay. Uh -huh. um, but I think at that point, what happened is they sent me for a, another CT because I was worried about active bleeding. Obviously, mm -hmm. I think the CT didn't show any active bleed, so they were kind of a wee bit at a miss as to why I was vomiting blood at that point. Um, but anyway, the consultant had been called and he had come round. He's like, "That's fine," and he was he was going home for the evening. Um, and then obviously later that night, that was when it really took the turn for the worse. And I, I, I was literally, you know, I was, I was I just vomiting continuously and it was just blood all the time. Um, and at that point, you know, they, they invoked the, whatever it is, a major hemorrhage protocol, but there was people coming from all directions to see me. And I remember just being absolutely terrified because I thought, I'm, I'm dying here. This is, this is not great. Mm -hmm. um, so... The consultant got called back in. He was apparently he was going out for a meal with his wife, apparently, and he came <laughs> back in. Um, and by that point, I get there was people tending to me, and I get rushed down to the theatre. And I just I can remember in the theatre, I was literally begging them to put me to sleep because I was so distressed. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to the nurse, "Just tell my family I love them." Um, that was the last thing I kind of said to the nurse. And I then I remember that they knocked me out. And after that, I don't really remember. So an at, awful, at that point, you're thinking. Well, I, I'm I, saying about goodbye. I, I I didn't know if I was going to wake up again, but mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And so at that point, um obviously they they operated on me. Um and I remember, you know, the next thing I remember was being in the intensive care unit and waking up. And this is a bit where it starts to get hazy for me because I don't really remember an awful lot about it, but I remember waking up my um, the intensive care unit and you know, over the course of a few days to a week, I was actually making a bit of an improvement and starting to get better to the point where um, the intensive care consultant came and spoke to me and said, it looks like you're, you're going to be good to get um, discharged downstream into a ward, into a, into a regular ward. So that was, that was great. I was, I was feeling good and saying that. that was a, mentally, that was a positive thing for me. I was really, really happy about that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, and again, this is hazy, but whatever happened at that point, I, I took... You know, I kind of fell off a cliff at that point because that was. I always remember going back and seeing that ITU consultant going, "I was ready to discharge it that day to to award." And 
Um, so again, I'd a, another um, another uh, hemorrhage, major bleed situation. Um, but it was a lot worse than the first one. Um, and again, I was rushed to theatre, and I think during that whole process, that's the this is about this very hazy. But over a over a period of five days or six days, I think I had six or seven emergency operations. Um, and at one point, I lost ninety five units of blood which is 15 times the volume of the blood in your body. Which means, how much blood do you have? Is it like so, nine so, litres or something? So the, the, yeah. the consultant told me it was 15 times the volume. Wow. Um, they ran out of blood for my blood group type in Scotland that night. They actually get blood flowing up from Manchester for me. Um, and he did say to me, if somebody had come into A&E that night needing blood of that blood group, they had a decision to make whether giving it to me or giving it to them. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely you know, horrendous, petrifying. It, it, um, but it's amazing to think of all all the elements that were fighting for you to keep you alive in terms yeah. of so blood getting rushed up from Manchester, all these consultants, everything going away, just doing their damn just to try and keep you yeah keep no, you going. Hundred percent. And and as I can already tell earlier on, the consultant that was there that night, they couldn't find the bleed. They actually couldn't find it. He said that he said literally when they didn't have a clamp on whatever it was the blood was actually spraying out on his face and he's he always he joked to me and it was really funny it was funny funny looking back on it but he was going for his dinner with his wife at night he didn't even have time to change and apparently his shoes get wrecked um, <laughs> so you so, own my so, pair so, of so shoes I do I own my, my pair of shoes um, but apparently you know during that he did he he had had um, he'd worked in gunshot victims in, in Africa and, and lots of stuff so he'd, he'd lots of kind of real trauma. Emer- emergency trauma experience and apparently you get some radiologist to inf- they, they put some kind of balloon up one of my main arteries and inflated it above my heart to allow them to control the bleeding. So by doing that, it stopped the blood flow enough for them to see where it was coming from. And then they actually managed to clamp that, that off or do whatever it was they did and fix that and then do it. So, And I think a lot of the stuff they did that night, some of it's made it into medical journals and case studies apparently. Um, I think there's been quite a lot of case studies on, on what they actually did. So I think the consultant um, deserves a name check. Who's the... Uh, so his name's Ewan Dixon. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, the guy's an, an absolute genius, to be honest. Yeah. He didn't save my life. So so I think one of the, the things that, that, that came across, you're, um, you're an analytical person and you like to understand things, yeah. sometimes to a fault. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll accept that. I'll accept uh-huh. that. Um, and uh, you were, I can remember with all the other doctors, you were getting massively, massively frustrated. But with your consultant, I think in terms of how brutally honest he was yeah. um, with the facts, in terms of let's not try and make assumptions, mm. it kind of resonated with your kind of more analytical side. Yeah. Um, and you did get a wee bit of peace from that in terms of saying, well, I trust him and... Yeah, definitely. And, and his whole approach was tackle one problem at a time and mm-hmm. and tackle it as it comes along, which did definitely mm-hmm. help. And, and he did keep me in my box in terms of, because I was always trying to, Give what's, the next, what's, the next, what's the next step? What's the next <laughs> step? What's the next step? <laughs> so he's, no, he definitely was, uh, yeah. so he was, good, he was good at that. And, and, and you know, I, I, I've got um, a lot of respect for that man for what he did for me, obviously, mm-hmm. qu- clearly. Um, yeah. It's just thinking back on it now, it's, it's quite unbelievable to think. Um, you know, some of the story that we, I didn't tell there was the whole thing around what happened after that bleed and after those operations, stuff like that. So I was actually in intensive care, ventilated for four weeks. Um, was it as long as four weeks? It was four Bloody weeks. Hell. And during that time... Um, are you completely out when you're ventilated or are you... You are sedated right. um, and they control the levels of sedation. So... I, for a uh-huh. lot of that, I was completely out. Uh-huh. Obviously, they need to start reducing the sedation. Sedation is for me to say. Sedation to actually bring you, um, bring you back round and make mm-hmm. sure you're coping and able to manage on your own. Um, during that four week spell, I, you know, I think it was multi organ failure. My, my kidneys were failing. I was on dialysis. Um, I think at one point as well, my liver was failing, and they actually told um, they told Christine that if my liver didn't respond to treatment. There wasn't really anything else they could mm-hmm. do for me. Um, I can always remember getting a call from Christine. We were going to a All Hands event when we get all the staff together. Mm-hmm. Um, we were just about to walk into the place. And I don't know if it's a nurse in her, um, but she's got a very deadpan way of delivering brutal news. Yeah. In terms of, <laughs> Probably a lot of experience in Yeah, that. going, hi, hi, how you doing? <laughs> um, just to let you know that we've been told that um, Brian's in a critical way. 
Um, and at one point she was saying it was from minute to minute. They were told, um, they've told us not to look over minute to minute. Then the next update was okay, it's now hour to hour. Yeah. Then eventually we got to, to, to day to day. Um, but I don't think you were expected to survive at that point, were you? No. Um, Christine was, was called in basically, and, mm -hmm. and her and my mum actually stayed in the, the relative room overnight that night. And she said that every now and then she could hear footsteps in the corridor and she was terrified it was somebody that was going to come in to tell her I hadn't mm -hmm. made it. Yeah. Um, she was getting, you know, previous to that, she was getting phone calls for the consultant and the consultant was saying to her, um, he's still alive. Mm -hmm. That was the update. Uh -huh. So that was how, 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 dire the, how dire the situation was. How dire the situation mm -hmm. was. And it's uh, clearly, it's, it's horrific for you, but it's also the wider family, isn't it? One hundred percent. Yeah, Aye. I mean, uh, in some ways, obviously, I've been through both the physical and mental trauma. But in some ways, I mm -hmm. think Christine and the kids have suffered more mental trauma than I have because yeah. for it. a lot of the a lot of the, the worst times, mm -hmm. I was you know, um, unconscious basically. Uh, from from Christine, I've never met someone who acts like a guardian angel so much in my life. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, and that woman had your back at every stage. No. I can remember when I was in visiting in, um, in intensive care, there was consultants running away from her. No, I mean, I, I, um, she, she, she was formidable, but all she was doing was making sure somebody was fighting your corner. Yeah. I think it's because she works in the NHS as well. She knows that you, know, you need to push certain buttons and you need to do stuff. But um, I've, I've never seen someone protect a loved one so much. Yeah, I think in terms of your know, interest in her and, her and the consultant <laughs> that I was talking about, I, I don't think they saw eye to eye. Uh -huh. I thought I think it was mm -hmm. a lot of kind of run-ins. Yeah. Um, but as you say, it was Christine was just looking at for my best uh, every you know, time, every, every time, turn. and she still does. Uh -huh. you know, even even now, and I think she's got a bit of PTSD. Even things like me going out and going mm -hmm. to places now. She's like, ah, do you do? Where are you uh -huh. going? What are you doing? When when you be back? Uh -huh. you know, she's she's very protective that way now as well. Yeah. But you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't get through this with Christine if I'm being, being absolutely honest with you. No, no. I'd, she's I'd, she's been there for me. She's dragged me along. You know, some really really dark times and in, in intensive care, as you know, mm -hmm. you, you you know you you saw me as well. Um, but I think you, you know when I woke up for that being ventilated. I literally could only move my fingers. Mm -hmm. I had to learn to walk again. I had to learn to do lots of stuff mm -hmm. again. And it was terrifying. And there was times in there where I was lying in that bed. And you remember that wee box room I was in, yeah. you know, external windows mm -hmm. or anything. You know, there was times in there where, you know, I never ever gave up. I wouldn't say I gave up, but mm -hmm. there was times where I was in a really dark place. Yeah. And Christine would come in and, you know, if it wasn't for Christine, sometimes it was tough love for Christine as well. Oh, saying, absolutely. But if I didn't have that, I don't mm -hmm. think I would yeah. have made made it through the way I did. And there was, you know, there was other other staff and people as well that were really key. The whole um, learning to walk again and stuff like that. There was a, there was a physio who, uh, you know, I'm still in contact with now and, you know, quite friendly with, mm -hmm. um, that she actually was instrumental in getting me back on my feet and getting me to the point where even Christine was coming in some days and saying, geez, oh, is he actually using like kind of something called a stand aid? Is uh -huh. he using that already and weight bearing himself? And she mm -hmm. said it was, it was remarkable how quickly I got for nobody mm -hmm. even moved to, right. to that. Because um, I don't think people realise what intensive care is until they actually have to either be in it or visit someone in it. Yep. So um, Christine, again, looking after you in terms of the mental side and all the rest that she was determined to get us all in, um, you probably didn't want us there yeah. um, in terms of what we're doing, but she was adamant, nope, you're coming in, come and see him. Um, and of course, looking forward to seeing you, but as soon as you walk into that intensive care, and <laughs> it shouldn't be a surprise, but no. it's all full of very sick Probably, people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no one was laughing or cheering or uh, uh, anything like that. So that that took me away in terms of what that. Then they, they yeah. took them into the room. Um, the level of care was phenomenal. All these nurses coming in, they genuinely cared about you. You, 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 you could you could see that. But um, I think for you sitting here now, compared to because um, you were sitting in a chair almost identical to that yeah. when, when I first came in, you couldn't lift your head. No, um, you actually couldn't couldn't lift your head. Um, and I'm sitting there, rabbit and shit, trying to <laughs> fill the silence and stop myself from spewing because of all, <laughs> all, all the cables and, I, uh -huh, yeah. and bleeps and, and liquids flying about. I'm looking <laughs> at the ceiling and I asked something. What have you been doing today? Now, one of these idiotic things that you <laughs> like, well, actually, what I've been doing today, and your, your answer will stay with me forever. Um, you said, this week I've heard three people die. 
<laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Not expecting that answer. No, I wasn't expecting yeah. that answer because it was a room next to you. It was, and I always remember it would, um, the room I was in, it had a special glass where they could flick the button and uh-huh. it made it opaque. Yeah. And I always remembered what they would do. So the glass would be, it would be clear mm-hmm. in normal times. Yeah. And I'd be able to look out onto the ward. Uh-huh. Um, and then a nurse would come in and say, Brian, we just need to change the windows for a minute. Change the windows and then you would see the shadow of a, a trolley getting wheeled past. Uh-huh. And it was always the person that, that had been in the room. Who didn't make it. To the right, that didn't make it. Which was really, that was when you actually realise how dire a situation mm-hmm. you're in. When people are literally dying and getting wheeled out of the place. Uh-huh. I um, think I'm my next. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in, you know, intensive care for eighty four days. Mm, I'd, which is and that obviously they don't put intensive care together to be aesthetic outside this place it's pleasing. It's a functional room. Yeah. In terms but I think from the mental fortitude that you showed to be in that because it basically was a glass windows box with machines. Yeah. No for, for eighty four days. Definitely. For over two months. And I would say now mental mental strength wise my mental strength is probably through the roof of where, mm-hmm. it, where it was no. previously now, just through the circumstance and to deal with that and be there and do it. And, you know, it was some some long old days in there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the things that you you said to me in passing one time, and again, it's, it's these wee, the wee throwaway things that resonate with you forever. Mm-hmm. When I was saying, when you're trying to give you a pep talk or trying to do something in terms of the thing you said, there's worse things than living. Yeah. There's worse things than dying, sorry. Yeah, yeah, dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's worse things than dying. You think? Yeah, and I think there was at certain points that, you know, that genuinely was how I felt. Yeah. Because you just thought, how can... I think even at certain points you thought, how can I come back for this? Uh-huh. Because obviously you go for flying along quite nicely, your life, you know, everything's going well, family's going well, job's going well, mm-hmm. all, everything, everything, everything wanted to, to bang. You're in that glass box. You've got no real view. You know how, like, a timeline uh-huh. for things. <laughs> yeah. You've got no real view on how long something's going to take. I think one of the biggest frustrations for me was, and that was where that consultant was great as well, he never ever gave you a timeline. He says it'll be what it'll be. Uh-huh. When you're fit and well enough, that's when it'll be. Mm-hmm. And that was probably good for me to hear because I was constantly going when, you know, I want a date. Uh-huh. What's going yeah. to happen? He's like, I can't tell you. I uh-huh. don't have one. It'll depend how you react to certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, so after your 84 days and I, I think in terms of what you were saying about mental fortitude um, you know I don't like the, to give you too many compliments but in terms <laughs> of bravery and sheer stubbornness um, <laughs> I, I, I think you win an award for that because yeah. um, even in those darkest days you were always moving forward you were always moving forward to the point of if if they were asking you to do something now. Christine would maybe have to give you a ride for you to do it properly. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I think that. Was, uh, <laughs> I think in certain days that was definitely uh, the case. Um, but you did it, and you carried on doing it. And I think the speed of your recovery to that is all down to your mental fortitude. Yeah, I think one of the things I would say, and you know, I would what I'd say him does, just never give up. Mm-hmm. You need to just keep going. And and I, I obviously watched your watch your podcast a lot and. The stuff that you're doing around you know, with, with, with Jesse and and your your training program and you know it's all about that. Mm-hmm. You know it's no enjoyable, but you know you need to get up and do it and keep going. That is true, and it's amazing. So so one of the things for me is a it's amazing what you can get used to, and b it's amazing what you can accomplish. That you, that first thing you said is amazing what you can get used to. Is, um, beautiful and terrifying in the same right, isn't it? Yeah, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yeah, because some of the things. Even now, you know, because obviously I'm I'm waiting to to get um, the Humpty Dumpty operation for me to put me back together again. Uh-huh. Um, but even now, some of the things that I'm doing on a daily basis and what I'm used to now, if you'd told me that before all this happened, I would have told you you were crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would not have believed. And that. I, I I think you you underestimate the kind of impact that your th- things had on other people's life. You couldn't watch what you've been doing for not being inspired, but also not not take realization. So. Within the Data Vita family, you were by far the fittest and healthiest person <laughs> out, out, out the lot of us. Um, by far, no, I mean you yeah. were you you read, led, led a very balanced lifestyle yeah. um, with the the rest of us. Maybe not so much. Um, um, for, for That's a sorry state of affairs. No, I, was, I mean you, you were you were you were a fit individual. You didn't overindulge in anything. You were um, you were you're quite a balanced, yeah. um, quite a balanced guy. Um, that way um, so it almost seems unfair that it happened to you uh, <laughs> rather than it happened to anyone else but um, 
after after that, that acted as a, a bit of a wake-up call for me as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that I'm doing now and the change I made to a lifestyle probably are directly impacted by by the the realisation what I have and what the, your health means to and you. And that you're not invincible. Aye, uh-huh. Yeah, uh, you know, definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that is one of the things that is important to look after mm -hmm. yourself first and foremost with, with everything. Mm -hmm. um, and if you weren't as fit as you were, you wouldn't be here either. The, the, the doctors did say that to me. They did say part of the reason I made it was because I had a, a good degree of fitness. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's someone... Um, if, there's, if there's someone sitting in hospital right now listening to this in a bad way um, with all the mental anguish if you were sitting next to them what would you say? So I would say to them I completely understand that you're feeling down and things are really really dark you just need to keep going and you need to power through it mm -hmm. and that's about that's about the only advice it's I can give It's perseverance isn't it? You've got to just keep going that, mm -hmm. that is it I, when I was in hospital in some of the darker times, you know, there was obviously the, the hospital psychologists and stuff where the doctors were really keen for me to speak to them. You know what I'm like. Yeah. I'm not a big believer in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I really, I really am. Um, but, you know, it was desperation stages. So I thought, well, there was no harm, give it a try. Um, so the, the psychologist came along, came and spoke to me. And every single time they spoke to me, we got back to the same place. The only thing that was going to make me feel better was getting out of there. Aye. And that was what I said to her. I said, look, you, we can do whatever you want. You can tell me, you can say this, you can say that, all these techniques. The only thing that's going to make me feel better is getting out of here mm -hmm. and getting better. And so, that was kind of where I got to. And she, she did, um, funny story, she did some mindfulness stuff for me, which was very nice. <laughs> uh -huh. you know, it was great. <laughs> and a bit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Part of it did a bit but I've got quite a good story of that um, recently. When I don't know why, but I thought, so I'm going to look at this mindfulness again. Mm -hmm. So I put it on, I put on YouTube or one of these things, and um, so the the, the thing comes out says like clear your mind and you know close your eyes and imagine being somewhere. And unbeknown to Christine, I was doing this up the stairs, and Christine started hovering just as it says clear your mind. What can you hear? <laughs> so all I can hear now, whenever I think of mindfulness, I just think of Christine doing the hovering. Yeah, hovering. Yeah, so and that was you done with mindfulness. That, that was me done with. So. Uh huh. Um, I saw a, a, a funny thing on TikTok or YouTube and it was talking, I, I was a comedian talking about mindfulness and he was saying that um, before iPhones we all used to practice mindfulness, like sitting in the bus, <laughs> watching the water drip down the wind, window, he said that's now classified as mindfulness and yeah. you, would, you would pay somebody to go and do that. Um, so after your 84 days in hospital, um, you're by no means out of the woods there. So after that 84 days, how how long were you back in the ward for? Um, it was a good good... Stranger it's thing. A, it's a good two or three months. Uh -huh. I get out. Um, I get out just about the end of November, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. That year. Um, but even when I get out, so I was so obviously when they told me I was getting close to getting home and getting out, I thought, fantastic, that's great, going mm -hmm. home. Um, I think I'd be home in time for Christmas. I'm be really good. What I didn't realise is how dependent you are on people in the hospital when you're there and how much you're getting done for you. Mm -hmm. And when I got home at first. I could barely get up the stairs when I, when I got home at first. That was so, a test, wasn't it? Yeah. If you could... Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and that week, actually, and, and, and talking about, you know, just sheer will to get out of there. At the start of that week, the physio that I was telling you about, she came to see me and says, right, we need to get you doing stair practice, we need to get you doing this and that. And for some reason, I was in a load of pain in my abdomen. I had a lot of pain in my abdomen. I got all these drains and different things sticking in and out of me. Um, and even just moving, it was really uncomfortable. And it got to the point where I was actually scared to get up at the bed because it was so sore. Um, and at the start of that week, you know, I tried to do a stair practice and that, how painful it was. It was like, and, and even the physio said to me, says, Brian, I don't think you're going to be ready to get out this week. So I stuff this. But that, uh, was yeah. a, that was a catalyst for me. So what we ended up managing to do, and again, the physio was instrumental in that, we worked out that, no, no really, it doesn't take a genius to work this out, but we put a, a really compression bandage around my midriff uh -huh. and that kept everything and it really dealt with the pain. Mm -hmm. And that went me and then it was just sheer determination to get up and down those stairs enough for them to say, right, okay, you've done enough to get mm -hmm. out. And it, it really was because when I got home, you were going up and down the stairs at home. I think I did um, 13, 13 stairs in the hospital mm -hmm. and that was how many we had in the house. So deliberately, right, I can do 13 when I get home, try to do the stairs at home. So how long God. was that you were in hospital for from start 
I was going to say you finished it until your first time it's out. A, it's a seven month Seven stay. month, seven month stay. Yeah. So when you leave the hospital, it must almost feel like you're in a film or something like that, or reality passes you by, or... It feels kind of surreal because mm-hmm. you're, you're that, that whole seven months has went by and... But the world's just the same, it's just... Aye, uh-huh. aye, it's just back to the way it was previously uh-huh. almost. Mm-hmm. Well, clear, clearly not, but... Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a really odd feeling. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really was was strange. It was such a such a relief as well to uh-huh. actually be getting out. But again, that was just the start of the that the was the start struggle. of the next stage of recovery mm-hmm. and and just managing at home and you know the, all this regime for keep myself obviously still can't eat or drink or do anything mm-hmm. like that. So I need to feed myself through tubes and do bits and pieces um, mm-hmm. in that way. But in terms of your your typical spirit and this is going to make me sound like a, a, a draconian uh, employer here but you got out after being seven months in hospital and you were working again within something like two weeks yeah I think I was back working again very early in December ah, very early in December now I would just like to say for all the lawyers <laughs> listening that, that, <laughs> that had absolutely nothing to yeah, do with yeah, that, t- that was that was that was um that was my own decision, clearly. Uh-huh. And we obviously, we did, you, you, clearly, we were very, very concerned. For it. I always kid John that you, after Christine, you're the, you're the next person that sent uh-huh. me. You sure you're all right. coming for me. That's the only reason, Brian. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you were obviously very, very cautious and very, very careful what you're doing, you know, don't be. But as I said to you back then, and I, and I still am adamant to this day, psychologically, that was and, and is still brilliant for me mm-hmm. because. When I got to that December date and started doing work again, and don't get me wrong, it probably took me a, a number of weeks to get up to any kind of sense of speed mm-hmm. and being back to being being able to being able to cope with the, the rigors of what I needed to do. Uh-huh. Psychologically, it was great for me because it was normal, uh-huh. and that was the biggest thing. And even even till today, you know, my life's still nowhere near what it was before because mm-hmm. I'm still restricted in what I can do and blah blah blah. But I think work has been a constant for me mm-hmm. and it just feels like it's the way it's always been yeah no so, as in um, it's again it's remarkable to yourself the how quickly you because i i genuinely thought you'd be doing the equivalent of coloring in for a, for a <laughs> while no, i mean I, I didn't expect you but but no you were writing amongst the weeds again and we, i can remember several times saying stop yeah. no don't get involved in this um, but you threw yourself right back into it. I don't know if that was a control thing as well, about I can control this, I can influence it, I can... Well, a- absolutely, and I think there is an element that, and, and you know I do like a wee bit of control. Um, mm-hmm. But I think when you're in that hospital situation, everything's taken out your hands. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in control of nothing. Uh-huh. So there probably was a big element of that. Um, big, big element of control. So, um, but it's not all been plain sailing when you've been out either, has it? No, unfortunately, um, unfortunately not. There's been a few wee speed bumps so, along the way. So um, you've ended up back in hospital two or three times? Yeah, I think three three times. Three I think. times. I think it's every time I tell you how well I'm doing, it seems to be the next day. Know, I, so I, you I probably find that. after this, I'll be, uh-huh, you get a phone that. call for Christine tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, every time I get a text, I'm feeling good. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Cat bounce. Don't, don't, don't say uh-huh. um, so what, what's the... The next stages clearly you've said you're, you're still in the the recovery phase um so what's next for you so i'm waiting on them doing the recovery operations for me so they're planning to put everything back together the best they can um they've been waiting on me getting obviously fitter and stronger and mm-hmm. able to do that and um, just very recently they've said to me they think i'm now at that level where i'm i'm ready and they would be willing to operate on me again mm-hmm. Um, so there's two consultants involved now. There's another, there's a, the, the original consultant I spoke about, and there's a new consultant who's to do with the nutritional team, because mm-hmm. um, obviously all the, all my, my stomach and my bowel and all these things uh-huh. will need to be all put back together in, mm-hmm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner. So they're planning on doing that operation at some point in the next next few months, hopefully. Um, and that, to ask a stupid question, that must be terrifying thinking about that, because as you're sitting here just now, you're. You're on an up- upward curve. Um, you're getting more yeah. and more freedom from Christine in terms of <laughs> um, she's letting you go further afield. She's letting me come and speak to you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Christine. <laughs> um, but I take it that's a big op. That's a yeah. It's a it's a it's a major operation. So there's fifty percent of me excited because I know I need to get it done, and mm-hmm. it'll be great to actually be on a. I've been on a recovery for the last two years to get to a point to get operated on again basically uh-huh. 
Whereas after this one, hopefully that is then me on the road to recovery to getting back to normal life. Um, so fifty percent excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I, as I, as I've as I've told you, the the consultant actually took me through and drew me a diagram of all the stuff they're going to do, right and that was pretty scary. It's it's frightening. So you know, and saying things that like we need to clear the theatre list for the whole day for you and things like that just make you realise this isn't just going and. You know, getting a very wee simple operation done. Yeah. It's uh, the diagram was like a cabling diagram that we would put together on the data set. <laughs> Honestly, it was like we'll take this and test, and we'll hook up to here. We'll take this from here. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's got a lot of a lot of detail on it, and it's it is scary when you look mm-hmm. at that. But but I, I guess you I, just see it as a necessary step because um, yeah. you want to get back to as close to a hundred percent as you can. Yeah, I, I I'll never get to a hundred percent, but. I'm pretty confident I can get to 95 mm-hmm. and if I can get to 95 and if you told me that at the start of all this I'd bite your hand off uh-huh. basically where I'm at because mm. you've not eaten or drunk anything in what two years almost no not not mm-hmm. properly in two years no no what would be your first meal oh, it's a tough one right. um I do like a steak a steak yeah um but bizarrely I've got a strange craving for Chinese food aye I so, get that that's aye, not strange so, so I think um David McKenna keeps promising me he's going to take me to the whole wong when I'm yeah. better. So oh. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, no, we go around the whole wong so much. <laughs> but I take it after the operation, it wouldn't be day one whole wong. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I think it'll be baby food probably on oh. day one. So obviously I'll need to build back up to, it'll be, I imagine it'll be soups and yogurts and oh. soft food building up to, to something. Yeah. Um, but I will still need to take things like. Um, Tablets and stuff before it, because it, the, the prank is just gone, isn't it? The, it's uh, not gone, but it's it, it's so badly damaged it's not doing it, and, um, mm-hmm. not really doing it. And so the pancreas has two main functions: it breaks, helps break down your your food and stuff like that, um, and it controls the levels of insulin in your body. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm diabetic now mm-hmm. as well through all this, um, which has been a struggle for you as well, isn't it? That it's, it's been a struggle. That's been part of the struggles is actually getting that under control, and ironically because of the way I need to get fed and stuff like that, mm-hmm. it actually makes it more difficult. So if my blood sugar goes low, because I don't really absorb anything, it's very, very difficult to bring it up. So they've always kind of said, keep your blood sugar on the higher side uh-huh. um, because it's a lot easier to, I fix, that. to fix that than mm-hmm. it is um, anything else. Because yeah, you can't eat a Mars bar or... Uh, no, you can't, no, so yeah. I, yeah, no, I can't just take a can of cola or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, I could, but it wouldn't have any... Well, I couldn't take the Mars bar. I could drink a can of cola, but it would just come straight back out and... Uh-huh. and it wouldn't have any impact on me really. Aye. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so the NHS, clearly, um, the NHS gets a, a lot of pelters as well. So there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. But I guess f- from your perspective, from from what you've seen, it's mainly the people, isn't it, that yeah, keep that going? My experience has been unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, I, and I get kind of annoyed and frustrated when I hear people bad-mouthing it. Yeah. Um, they were... They've been there for me every step away. The people, you know, you, you mentioned it yourself. The the, the people in even at, you know, every ward, not not just I at intensive care, mm-hmm. but they really did care and they were actually rooting for you to get better. And the, you mm-hmm. know, they were they really had had my back in terms of mm-hmm. help me help me get. And some of them pop in and see you, don't they? When they're, uh, they're, they're it's amazing. I'm, mm-hmm. Christine says I'm not a celebrity in that hospital now because every time again, there's loads of people know me and they're like, oh look at you, look how yeah. well you're doing. And as um. It's not the kind of place you want to be a celebrity, I don't no. imagine. But uh, and they're all there still today, doing it for someone else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, 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 again. and the hours that they work, and you know, there, there, there's people that look after me, and it was like you know they were they were there constantly, mm-hmm. absolutely constantly. Right. You know, there was one um, one example went see when I was really really ill, and I was going through all those operations and stuff like that. The intensive care um, consultant was with me for 48 hours straight, Christine told me. She did not go home. She stayed for 48 hours. That's incredible. And stayed to make sure that everything that was getting needed to get done got done and she was making sure it was all getting controlled. And So, I mean, that that is, you mm-hmm. talk about above and beyond. And that, that's, that's one patient? One patient. One patient. And the place is, it's so busy. Mm-hmm. It's beyond belief. And they're underfunded, they're understaffed, they're, yep. um, they're, they're, they're fighting a losing battle. Yeah. Um, as an, or, an organisation, they're, they're on their knees as an organisation, but mm-hmm. the people are still, you know, long, hard shifts mm-hmm. looking after caring for people. Unbelievable. And if you lived in America or something like that, you'd be bankrupt. They would just have been turning the machines off, I think, Aye. to be honest. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I think they would be. I, I don't know. 
I don't know how accurate this is, but the consultant did say at one point you know, we were into five million pound. Well, well worth it. Well worth it, Brian. <laughs> that, as, as cheap at half the price. I think so. Um, moving on slightly in terms of away from the the bionic, bionic man that yeah, sits, no, just... sits in front of me. Um, so, in your roles, Chief Technology Officer, Data Vita, you've had one of the worst jobs probably over the the last three <laughs> months, which is. Um, not even that, probably two months, which is trying to sort out um, the commercial shit show, which is Broadcom buying VMware. Yep. Um, so anyone That's who's not a techie now, you can just stop watching. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend th <laughs> Thanks for watching and goodbye. Move um, on to the second segment. Uh, um, but um, Broadcom, um, who are a big, nasty American organisation, yep. who um, have a history of taking really good tech companies and basically asset stripping them, I guess, to a point, yeah, um, and really underinvesting them, taking out all the profit and screwing the customer base is a kind of MO. Um, and we've seen that again, that behaviour with VMware. Now, um, I think VMware's impacted more because it's at the foundation of almost ev every bit of enterprise IT and every service provider data centre. Yeah, it's so integral to what a lot of organisations are doing. And that's it. why they bought it. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 you know, in fairness, it is, it, it, it is the best hypervisor available. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. it is the, and it's not just the hypervisor element, as we well know, it's it's the whole ecosystem round about it. Mm -hmm. That's where the problem comes. Um, the way they've done it, you know, very, very little notice, the level of information, cancelling the partner programmes for for all partners and then starting from scratch and basically ripping up how it worked before and completely changing that mm -hmm. on such a short time scale and such an integral I, I can't understand how they're allowed to to do it in the manner they've done it to be honest it's, it's called greed and profit well yeah uh -huh. I, I, I guess that is but I get you know, even just for the your know, competition law perspective and stuff like that because that that is playing into you know the hands of public cloud and and, and you know these kind of providers as well, mm -hmm. where that that often, you know, becomes a lot more attractive potentially. It's funny how VMware was always seen as the last bastion for the private ecosystem, yeah. And and it's actually VMware who's tried to put the last nail in the coffin for that. Um, yeah. And the, the the guys at AWS and Microsoft, they must be absolutely rubbing their hands. They will be. Mm -hmm. They will be because you know we've done a lot of work. Um, looking at alternates and there are you know, it's not to say I'm, I'm not saying for a minute there aren't any alternates out there but you're not going to move for VMware to an alternate in a matter of a couple of weeks mm -hmm. you know it takes planning it takes thought it takes a whole migration process it's the ecosystem it's the biggest problem is finding the tool sets that work with them if I was a backup vendor or a, 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 you know, a, a DR tool vendor I would definitely be all over mm -hmm. looking at alternate hypervisors and try to make my products work with them because that would open up a whole world of opportunity. And that's what that's where we got to. It was almost like a Rubik's Cube that was fighting us back. Was yeah. it? We would think we'd get one solution, then you're, oh, there's a white butt yeah. uh, on, <laughs> on, on the wrong side. So um, we spoke to everyone from Proxmox to KVM to Nutanix to um, Citrix. And we, we, we spoke, that we, we looked at everything in some few and weird wonderfuls in between. But if we, we look at a couple of different scenarios, um, within our data centre, we have got a massive investment in the ecosystem. So VMware sits at the centre of it. Yep. Then we've got a massive investment in storage and networking and backup and all these other systems monitoring um, that dwarf the size investment time. And they, they actually dwarf the actual VMware element. There's yep. millions and millions of pounds of stuff. Uh, that's my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, rely on, um, that rely on VMware. Um, so... Whatever way we moved, if we went to another hypervisor, one would say, okay, it works perfectly, but see that multi-million pound investment in your backup technology? Yeah, you're throwing it out. That throws it out. And all of the legacy data that's on that, you're going to have to migrate. And migrating backups is a, an yeah, absolute it's disaster. A nightmare. Yeah, it's um, then we said, okay, well, let's do this other one because the the backup vendor supports this. So let's look at this one. Uh, but then you'll need to put all your storage in the bin. So um, all those petabytes of storage that you have. Yeah, you're, you're replacing it. You're replacing it. Um, so we've actually been kind of painted into a corner where the only solution is to try and re-architect our, our systems to to, um, to work with it. Um, so annoyingly, we... So VMware... When what was the drop dead date for the termination of our contract? Was it the thirty first of March? Thirty first of March, yeah. And we got our final pricing when? Um, Two weeks ago. Yep. 
Two weeks Five ago. It wasn't even two weeks. Uh-huh. Yeah, but uh-huh. a, week, a bit, week and a half ago. About, about a week and a half ago. So we've been told since Christmas that um, our partner agreement's getting terminated at the end of March. Yep. Um, and we'll need to buy via the new model, which... Yeah, with, with very little notice. Uh, we, we found out. Um, and it's not only that, there's new support kind of interoperability and all, all how it's put together. So that that's left us in a situation. Um, and, and they want you to do a three-year commitment. Uh-huh. So, so it's not just a on demand anymore. It's it's it, well, well there, there is an on demand. There is an on demand option, uh-huh. but you know mm-hmm. the on demand pricing is very very. Um, so know, I think for I think for one of our customers who we have an on demand model with, it was almost doubling the price. If we just passed that on to that customer, it would have been yeah. Your cloud prices is is now doubled. Um, so I guess what have we done to mitigate that? Because I think there's a lot of valuable lessons. Um, we've not been able to mitigate a hundred percent. No. Um, we are going to have to spend. We are spending hundreds of thousands of pounds, and if not millions, on new compute, because our current CPU ratios be stuff we never had to worry about. We now need to worry yeah. about. So we're having to spend millions of pounds on compute yep. to get to a, a model that works with VMware, because we're basically going for more powerful, higher consolidated C, uh, core counts. Yep. Um, to go from that. So. Um, what advice can we give someone who's sitting there with an old VMware cluster who's received the renewable and it's double the price? What what's from a techie and don't this isn't a data via sales thing. No, no. From, a, from a techie point of view, what can they do? So I think first and foremost you need to understand your workloads that you're mm-hmm. running on that platform. Um you need to look at your architecture. You know, again, are you using physical segregation versus logical segregation, that kind of stuff? Is there consolidation that you can do in terms of that? What you really, the only way you can really get around it is understand your workload entirely. So whether that's, you know, making sure that your, your VMs that you've got are not fat. So, that, you know, you're running, running VMs with four CPUs when they could quite happily run with one. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff to, to kind of slim down, trim down what you've got. Um, understand your CPU ratio as well. Too, you know, so it's all about the CPU now? It's all about the CPU. And it used to be all about VRAM. And it used to all about VRAM. Uh-huh. So it, it completely flips in his head. Um, the whole thing around CPU ratio, you know, I know we, we often have conversations mm-hmm. about CPU ratio. Um, you know, make sure you understand that fully and make sure you understand you know, what good practices and stuff like that. You know, people, again, the, the whole reason virtualization was born was to get that, get that ratio. And obviously, the, you know, the higher the ratio you go, Depending on your VM workloads, you do run a risk that you could potentially have some performance impact for certain workloads. Um, but there is a sweet spot where you can actually get it right and probably save yourself a pile of money as well. So it's all about, it's, you know, I like the sound of my own voice, but in one word, it's all about optimization, CPU uh-huh. optimization, really. And I guess it's the poor buggers that either have very, very low core counts in terms of, um, sorry, old CPUs basically. Yeah. Because um, there is a, a, it doesn't matter if you've got seven cores, they're going to charge you for 16 regardless. Yeah, it's a minimum, 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 minimum 16, 16 cores per CPU. Um, yeah. And we know of a lot of customers who have actually optimised their core count for Microsoft licensing purposes. Yeah. So they did the right thing and said actually we can reduce our licensing purposes by making sure that we've got um, a certain amount of sockets and a certain amount of cores. And with the new VMware model now, decimates it yeah it does yeah absolutely um, decimates (laughs) it but um i think the market will react to this as well i think it's going to have to Uh, i think you're right in terms of i think the interoperability will improve with the likes of other vendors it's going to have to i think for me personally you you a plan b wouldn't be a bad thing Mm -hmm. yeah because have to do this. What's the next move? Yeah, who uh-huh. knows going forward? And and they do have mm-hmm. history with you know Symantec yeah. and things like that. Where they have done and you say that asset stripping. You know what, mm-hmm. what's to stop them in three years' time saying right? Let's do another. Let's try and get you know yeah get another chunk of cash out of this. Well, what's next? A customer that uses Site Recovery Manager. They triple the price. Yeah, quadruple it. Uh, discount it. But that also, if you think about it, that plays into what's to stop public cloud providers and these big you know, mega organisations turning around and saying, you know what, we're going to rip, the, rip, rip up the rule book and completely change. Yeah, uh uh-huh. no, And what, 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 you know, what levers do you have at that point? Because obviously an organisation like that, they decide to do that, you know. And that is a worry with public cloud because there's a lot more in public cloud than yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. now than there is sitting with VMware. So um, 
Well, thanks very much for coming on. Thank As you. always, enjoy the chat. Yeah, uh, like it's quite it's therapeutic in here, isn't yeah, it? It's, it's uh, really nice, yeah. uh, you, you forget there's, <laughs> there's cameras sitting around with you. Um, I think in terms of a data vita point of view, we'll probably do more of these kind of techie chats in yeah. terms of what you're doing. But um, I thought it was really important um, to get the story out of you. Because um, no. hopefully there's somebody sitting in the Royal just now who stumbles across the podcast and um, it gives them a wee bit of hope. So. Well, if it gives them MD any kind of hope, mm-hmm. then that would be, it's been well worth doing. Excellent. Cheers, Brian. Thank you. Cheers.